Without further ado, we're very excited about this program on Ethel Hayes. Uh, our presenter today is Lauren Hunley, uh, who has spent 15 years in the museum field, earning her Master's of Arts in Learning and Visitor Center, uh, Services in Museums and Gallery through, oh, I'm going to slaughter this. Le Lester. Oh boy, I would have really hammered that one. Leicester University in England. She's worked for both small museums and national museum service organizations. She is the author of 101 museum programs on shoestring budget, and I believe we're in that. Is that fair? We are. Okay. And has presented at numerous museum conferences. Uh, she, of course, is currently the community historian at the Western Heritage Center and serves on the board of directors of the Mountain Plains Museums Association. This gives me an opportunity to introduce you to her also. Uh, as I met her, I actually met her at a, a museum conference and uh, she had taken over a whole busload of people and was engaging them in education. And I said, you know, someday we may have an opening at the Western Heritage Center. Send me your resume. And it was within about a year or so uh, that Elizabeth de Grenier mo moved on to grad school. And so uh, we actually had a lot of applications uh, and we went through a review process and she still floated to the top. And we're very grateful uh, to have Lauren Hunley here presenting on Ethel Hayes. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. It's um, make sure that this doesn't fall on me so I don't run over my time. I want to be respectful of your time today, too. Uh, it would be remiss of me. Uh, Ethel Hayes has captured our imagination. And I have to give a special thanks to my colleagues because I would do research and then I would get super excited and run into an office and say, oh my gosh, I have to tell you about this real quick. Uh, and they graciously put up with that. Um, Although, in full disclosure, I do, I graciously put up with them when they get excited about their research. So we're just a really supportive staff here, and it really allows us to delve into these topics and these concepts. Um, I do need to, to acknowledge uh, these presentations, or this presentation specifically, really would not be as complete without the cooperation of Ethel's family. Uh, we actually had significant correspondence with Ethel's granddaughter, who is living in New Hampshire, I believe, uh, sharing photographs, sharing stories. And today, Ethel's great niece is actually joining us today. And Leslie has shared her own stories and, and her own items uh, in regards to the Ethel Hayes story. And you know, as, as historians, we can do as much research into the primary sources that we can, but there's always holes. There's always a question of, wait, this name keeps popping up and I have no idea how they're related, what they did, why are they here? And being able to make those connections with those gatekeepers, with, with those, uh, the people who are in charge and who protect those family stories is so important to what we do. So I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge their involvement and to thank them for their willingness to share that information with us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to draw your attention, uh, maybe. It's changing on the, on the computer screen. It's not changing on the thing up here. Why is that? Look, I, I thought I had this all set up, guys. I was all ready to go. There it is, there it is. Okay, so uh, just taking a quick look at this slide for me. This is from Reading, Pennsylvania, 1925. Uh, this is their main comic or cartoon page of June 12th. And it's really fascinating because we have all of these comics here, but I would like to draw your attention to the bottom two. Every other comic on this page has a single name byline, William Smith. Harry. The two on the bottom have a dual name. They are also the only two drawn by a woman, and she gets two spaces. Everybody else only has one. So what is it about this woman and her style and the topics that she covers to make her so popular that this newspaper in Reading, Pennsylvania in 1925 would dedicate almost a quarter of this single page to this woman. I'd like to introduce you to Ethel Hayes. 
She has a lot of fun nicknames, Mother of the Flapper, uh, cleverest girl artist in America, that was actually given to her by a Helena paper, foremost portrayer of the American girl, I'm gonna admit that is a very heavy title and comes with a lot of responsibility. Uh, but possibly for us, one of the most interesting and intriguing parts is that she's from Billings. She calls Billings home, and she identified as a Montan in her entire life. Ethel was born the only girl, bless her life, in 1892. And if it weren't, uh, even if Ethel had decided not to go and make her own way, she and her family would still be on the map historically and locally. Her father, George Hayes Sr., was actually the Montana Secretary of State. He arrives in Billings in 1883, and if we remember our, our Billings history, it's less than a year after Billings is founded, so he is one of our earliest homesteaders. He's one of our earliest residents. He is a Yellowstone County treasurer. He is the first elected district clerk of court in 1889. He marries Jenny, uh, from, she's an immigrant from Wales, and they have four children, of which Ethel is the only girl. Ethel actually spends her grade school years in Helena as her father serves out his secret uh, state secretary term. But when they return to Billings, Ethel as a young lady becomes a little bit of a girl about town. She's very involved in the community. Uh, we know that she was very active in the theater. Um, I love her expression. She is so bought into whatever this role is. She's 100% committed. We actually have a review from her uh, senior class play. She took the lead in the play. It was called Mrs. Wiggs and the Cabbage Patch. It's obviously a play we're all familiar with. And the review basically says that the play is so horribly written that if it weren't for Ethel, giving her all, it wouldn't be worth watching. But because Ethel is so amazing in the role as Mrs. Wiggs, everybody in town should go see it. So we're already getting a little bit of a clue as to her personality, and she's very um, gregarious, she's very open, she's incredibly friendly, and she wants to involve as many people as she can. Uh, we have newspaper articles of her throwing pa parties with Cooley Moss. Uh, she was involved with a lot of the women's organizations, not as a member because she wasn't old enough, but she would hand letter their decorations and their name placards for dinner. Uh, I, she's incredibly stylish, as we can tell. I would actually wear that coat. And then when she hits high school, we really start to see her innate artistic talent coming to the fore. Uh, she is titled the art director for the art department for the Billings Coyote. Now let's be very frank, she's the only one in the department. <laughs> but she is taking the responsibility for all of the illustrations in the Coyote. We're talking from about 1909 to when she graduates in 1911. Uh, and her style is already becoming evident. Um, I don't know how many of you can draw, I can't, but this, putting bubbles on top of text in black and white and still being able to read the letter behind it, as a sophomore, this is incredibly impressive, and her lines are so beautifully clean. And um, we're already seeing her stance for women's issues as well when we look at the sports page. Um, that sports illustration, we're talking 1910, and who was her focal point? It's a female athlete. She was actually secretary of the athletic club at Billings High uh, her junior year. So we're really getting this glimpse into who she is and what she stands for and really where her focus is. So when looking at this, um, this talent, her two aunts really step forward and they say, you have talent, you need to develop this, this can be something really important and fabulous, we're gonna help you convince your family for you to go to art school. So in 1911, Ethel, at 17, 18, is able to convince her parents to allow her to travel to Los Angeles to attend the Los Angeles School of Art and Design for three years, by herself. She studies for three years in Los Angeles, uh, where she says things like, I learned how to paint pretty pictures, never dreaming that I was no pretty picture painter. 
Even with her time in LA, she becomes known among her classmates and among, among her instructor, instructors for her ability uh, to create the human form and to create expressive images and to really sketch things out. And she gets limited notoriety in the Los Angeles papers. Some of her sketches are actually published in the Los Angeles Times. And because of her work in LA, uh, she receives a full ride scholarship to attend the Art Students League in New York City. So now she convinces her parents to let her move from Los Angeles across the country to New York, we're talking 1914, 1915, by herself to study classical art. Now, the Art Students League, um, you may not have heard of it, but it's kind of a big deal. Uh, we have artists like Alexander Calder, who has a sculpture at Tippett Rise, and Barnett Newman. These are both alum of the Art Students League. So she's in the big leagues. And she's really setting herself apart from her classmates because of her innate ability to use color and to use shape and to create emotive black and white sketch images to the point that she actually receives a full ride scholarship to the Academy Julian in Paris. So now she's got to convince her, her folks to let her go to Paris <laughs> by herself. Although I'm sure if she needed chaperone, somebody would have volunteered to go with her. Um, unfortunately, when we check our timeline, this runs right up into World War I. So she's unable to attend that next step in her schooling. But as any good American girl, she recognizes, I have a responsibility to help the United States win the war effort. So she joins the Red Cross. She passes all of her examinations. She's gotten her passport. She is ready to step on a train and a ship and head over to Europe to help the American cause. But on a visit back here to Billings with her parents, she comes across an advertisement in the paper where government hospitals are looking for art instructors for veteran uh, injured soldiers. And she steps up and she goes, wait, this is a way, I'm trained for this. I can stay in my field. I can actually create career experience. I don't know if that's where her brain was going, but she definitely sees this as an opportunity for her that she's already, uh, she's more equipped to be able to handle. So she shifts gears over. Uh, she's actually transferred around the country teaching art to wounded veterans. And when we think about this, she's actually doing something really progressive. They're using art therapy to help injured soldiers deal with shell shock. So today we know this is PTSD. She's already experimenting with how to use art and art therapy to help these men deal with the trauma that they experienced on the battlefield. She eventually makes it to Johnson City, Tennessee. There's a, a very large hospital there with wounded soldiers. Uh, she has a full class full of young American boys. She walks in, she says, I'm, gonna te I'm here to teach you painting. And one young man says, that's great, but I'd rather know how to cartoon. And she says, I don't know how to draw cartoons. And her next class was empty. So recognizing that she has to adapt to her audience, like any good teacher, thank you, Ethel, uh, she actually enrolls in a correspondence cartooning class. So she takes it upon herself to learn cartooning so that she can teach the soldiers, and she stays two lessons ahead of them. So she gets the class, she does it, she turns in her assignment, and then she takes it and teaches, to the, teaches it to the soldiers. As part of that, her skill set is becoming noticed among other reconstruction aides and among her bosses at the government hospitals. So they basically add to her responsibilities that she now has to draw posters for propaganda purposes and for sanitary purposes in the hospitals. So she's drawing posters talking about, you know, germs are your enemy, wash your hands, or VD is really bad, be careful. Uh, which is really what gets her the title as one of Uncle Sam's Chuckle Girls. Now, unfortunately, none of these posters exist that I was able to found, find, and that made me really sad. Uh, but it's the first time that she starts combining cartoon images with these really witty messages. And she starts incorporating this blend of styles into her assignments for her correspondence course. Well, as fate would have it, 
The man who ran the correspondence course, his name was Charles Landon, he was the previous art director for the Cleveland Press in Cleveland, Ohio. And in one of his discussions with the Cleveland Press's editor, he shows him, hey, check out these drawings that one of my students is doing. She's actually really good. Within hours, the editor has offered Ethel a job. Now, Ethel admits, she says, I actually thought I was taking a layout job, which basically means she'd fill in like black spots in the photograph and, and help with the layout editors. No. She moves to Cleveland, Ohio, and they immediately start giving her reporters responsibilities and full sketch responsibilities in the newspaper. And what's really fascinating is it doesn't take long. This is an advertisement for Landon's correspondence cartooning course. He has Ethel Hayes lifted, listed as an alum to help sell his course. So now she's being used as advertisement. So her talent is being recognized right away. So when she starts out, uh, she originally is paired uh, with, for a piece called Vic and Ethel with a young, woman reporter named Victoria, and they were known as the Adventure Girls. They climbed church steeples, they you know, went polar bear swimming. If you're not familiar, it's when you knock a hole in the ice and you jump in and then jump back out. Uh, they went diving in 1923, and then they would, uh, Victoria would write the piece and Ethel would illustrate it. it. Became incredibly popular across the city. And then Victoria got married. And like every good American girl, when she got married, she resigned her job. And that leaves Ethel by herself. But being the girl that Ethel is, she doesn't care. So she starts making a market for her sketches on her own. And she starts developing the then and now pieces, where she would have the way it used to be and then illustrate the way it is today. She would have what's called goat getters, where she would illustrate, doesn't it just get your goat? when something happens. This particular comic is, doesn't it just get your goat when your girl says, love me, love my dog? <laughs> kind of agree with her there, but you know we're good. Uh, and we can really see the development of her cartooning style. Uh, Ethel herself admits that she drew a lot of influence from other comics of the time period. Uh, so comics like Nell Brinkley, who was really the only other predominantly or predominant female cartoonist of the time period. Uh, here we can see one of Nell's pieces. This is one of Ethel's pieces right next door, and we can see the influence in the facial shape here. Uh, Ethel would say of, of Brinkley that her work is just simply exquisite. Who wouldn't want to copy that style? She also admitted that one of her big influences was John Held Jr. Uh, in fact, she says, I just adore, adore John Held Jr. When I was battling with my first drawings in the newspaper office, I had to keep his drawings out of sight. His influence was so strong that I was prone to imitate. And we can see the, the influence that, that she's drawing here is a young newspaper illustrator. However, it doesn't take her long to start developing her own style. Within a year, uh, her work is noticed by the Newspaper Enterprise Association, or the NEA. This is the largest newspaper syndicate in the country. And they offer her a job. And so now she's creating and she's established her cartoons into two main strips. We call them strips, I guess. Uh, one is Flapper Fanny, the other is Ethel. And these are now added to the syndicate's uh, repertoire. Now, at the time, the National Syndicate, any newspaper across the country, so it was especially used by small town newspapers that didn't have a lot, didn't have as much local news to fill a daily paper. So they would subscribe to a syndicate like the NEA. The syndicate would give them a package deal of just a whole bunch of stuff, and then the newspaper could fill it, use it to fill their paper. So Ethel's work is added to the syndicate's collection that they would send out into the country. So basically overnight, Ethel's readership goes from Cleveland, Ohio, to almost a thousand papers across the country, predominantly in small towns. Now to really recognize um, why we continue to talk about Ethel, and why her comics were such a big deal in her time is to recognize the context, the historical context that she's working. So this is 1924. 
We are only four years after women have gained the right to vote. So this is my nod to Hazel, by the way. There she is. By the way, Hazel and Ethel went to school together. They went to parties together. They were really awesome, which might show us some of the influences that Ethel had. The, even though women are, st are really trying to find their agency and becoming independent voters, there's a lot of pushback. And um, people really strongly believe that women cannot think for themselves. They should not have that responsibility. They should not be focused on things outside the home. I actually really love this image here because it shows that a woman's um, brain should only be taken up with babies, men, fashion, and chocolates. <laughs> How dare a woman think of more than that? Uh, Arthur Brisbane in 1927 made the statement that a girl's life begins when she marries. Before Ethel starts drawing, um, unfortunately these, these themes are repeated in the comic strips of the day, or the, the cartoon strips of the day. Uh, before Ethel starts drawing, there are really only about two or three female cartoonists in the country that are able to support themselves with this as a career. And those women are really regulated to either incredibly innocent children, or the Cupid dolls, or like Nell Brinkley's work, the really overly romantic, sappy images. Ethel is able to blend all of this together. And she's able to create a comic that appeals to the modern young woman, where she works within some of these themes of home life and romance and fashion, but she uses those positions to start pushing back against expected gender norms. So we also have to understand that even though women it's looking good for women, right? They got the votes. They can start working away from the home. Things are looking up, but people really hated it and pushed back about it. These are, this is primarily happening in urban areas. Um, women in small rural communities are still very limited by what societal expectations are. Now, it's important to recognize that they did not live within those expectations simply because they didn't have the luxury to do that. I mean, everybody's needed on the ranch or the farm. But the expectations are still there. Uh, there is a group of women in the 1920s that intentionally and purposefully push back against these expectations. These are, of course, the flappers. Uh, they're very celebrated today. They've become almost synonymous with the 1920 decade. But it's really important for us to recognize that these women were very fringe. And they were very much on the outside and creating a counterculture in response to all of that cultural pushback that they were getting. So these women, these women had short hair. They wore rouge. <gasps> they powdered their knees. They wore shorts, short skirts. They wore dipping necklines that exposed collarbones. Uh, the flapper, F. Scott Fitzgerald actually uh, gets historic credit for creating the flapper after his wife, Zelda. Uh, he actually denied that at the time. He claimed that he modeled it off of other women. Uh, but we have to look at, too, that, that these women were not considered women that you would take home to meet your mother. Uh, Henry Menken said that a flapper is a silly girl full of wild guesses and inclined to rebel against the precepts and admonitions of their elders. There are a lot of state governments that really raise their ugly head against the flapper culture uh, and try to legislate what women can do. That doesn't sound familiar at all. Uh, for example, Virginia passes a legislative bill that prohibits women from wearing shirtwaists or evening gowns, which displayed more than three inches of her throat. Utah legislators worked to fine women whose skirts were higher than three inches above the ankle. Carmel, California passed a city law that said women could not wear heels taller than two inches without a permit from the city. Now, wait a minute in an attempt to stifle tripping and falling related lawsuits. <laughs> and yet here we have this rebellious culture that's really thumbing their nose at all of this. And Ethel takes it and runs. 
So Ethel is, starts depicting the flapper culture, and let's be honest, she doesn't pull any punches about who these women are. Ethel's girls drink and dance and smoke and wear makeup. Now, before this time period, even though women may have worn makeup, they would not admit it because if you wore makeup, you were a prostitute. That was the, that was the inclination. And now here we have Ethel depicting a woman wearing makeup. They're wearing pants. This is actually one of the first instances of women wearing pants in a daily newspaper. Uh, whenever I talk about Ethel with high schoolers, I always say, you know, who here's wearing, ladies who here's wearing pants? Thank Ethel. They're wearing shorts. They're reshaping what femininity is. They are athletic. They are equal to or better than the boys. I love this, that our hockey player has literally knocked the boy on his head. But you know what? She's also fashionable. She's also sassy. Uh, this cartoon here is entitled Equal Rights, and it says, since equal rights are all the vogue, shouldn't, so in chorus lines, instead of always being on stage for the men, they should have a little something for the ladies. <laughs> if the men are having fun with their cigarette girls, shouldn't a lady have a cigarette boy? <laughs> So she's, she's defining and kind of poking fun at, but still normalizing flapper behavior. And in the process, she's creating women who are self-confident. This is an incredibly masculine pose. Hands on hips, full frontal, direct eye contact, and it's a woman. She's independent. Women would not sit like this. She's self-sufficient. Uh, this one's really funny and maybe shows Ethel's roots a little bit. It says, um, why is it that boyfriends never call just after a snowstorm? <laughs> Her girls are in professional environments. They are not working from home. They are in an office and they are autonomous and they are driven. But you know what? Ethel's girls are also innocent and they're kind and they're domestic and they're even charitable. And she's developing this well-balanced, approachable character. And in the process, she's normalizing flapper behavior. And she's showing that these women are women. They are not an icon that we push to the outside for, uh, and, and make fun of or, or don't talk about or don't accept. That what these women are doing is, is really OK. And in the process, she starts reflecting and creating American culture for women simultaneously. So she's reflecting who flappers are and what they do. Uh, in fact, she became the voice of the flapper. Uh, flapper groups were known to kind of get together. And what did Ethel draw about us today? What did Ethel say about us today? They became, um, they really kind of saw her as a voice piece. But at the same time, she's creating a way for what we would identify as flapper culture to become mainstream in small town America. So here in the second comic, we see that short hair starts with the woman, the daughter. And the mother and the grandmother are not OK with it. And then it spreads to the mother. And then it eventually spreads to the grandmother. And this illustrates and shows us exactly what's happening across the country. Uh, she starts using this position to address kind of some really controversial topics. Uh, now, I admit that this caption is not one we would be okay with today, but when we take it in, con in the historic context that she has drawn it, our lady over here, we have a full-figured lady, and it says, you can be fat and still have a thin time. In other words, just because you don't fit what people think you should look like, it should not affect how you spend your time and how you think about yourself. Uh, this middle one is really fantastic and I think should continue running in newspapers. It says the only women getting, wi the only women getting men's wages are wives. <laughs> this last comment is really funny and really tongue in cheek in that uh, of course the bob haircut, those short haircuts are really starting to pick up. Uh, and it's one of the biggest things that people had issues with because 
the belief was a woman's beauty is in her hair. And that, that a woman's, you know, you have the long hair and that defines your femininity. And now all of a sudden we have all of these women who are cutting their beauty off. They're cutting their hair completely off. And there was a small um, unofficial pushback and a kind of a joke that men were saying, well, it's okay if you have short hair during the day, but if we go out at night, don't you want to put it up? Maybe you should wear a wig. So Ethel says, okay, if women can have short hair and have to wear a wig at night, then clean-shaven men should have to wear mustache wigs at night, too. <laughs> Ethel really starts affecting fashion. Uh, she was known to have her thumbprint on the fashions of the day. Uh, we're talking, she draws a lot of bathing suits. She must really love the beach. So just to give you a little bit of context, in 1914, the uh, south side pool here in Billings is open. So right around that time period, women could swim, but they had to wear a long skirted bathing suit and stockings. So imagine how comfortable that would be. Then they come back, the park board comes, at, comes back and says, well, okay, so the stockings are getting ripped and coming off and they're clogging our filter system. So I guess it's okay if you don't wear stockings. So here we are in the late 19-teens. By 1927, Ethel is encouraging women to wear brief-style bathing suits. This is a huge step. And as I said, she's normalizing and mainstreaming these looks um, all across the country. So now all of a sudden, we have housewives in rural Iowa with bobbed haircuts. And we have housewives or school teachers in Florida wearing shorter skirts. And we have women in Billings, Montana, who are wearing brief style bathing suits. So she's defining and creating women's culture as it changes. And we really see this reflected, if I can get my notes turned here. We really see this reflected with this example. Uh, so this is 1926. In January, Ethel runs this comic, or cartoon, I'm sorry. Um, so it's funny, it's cute, it's well drawn, but when we look at the woman herself, she's smoking. Can we compliment her on her rock and fishnet stockings? She is wearing a tight fitted sleeve, but obviously not wearing um, a fitted top, it's, it's still pretty loose. The slit that we see here gives the illusion that this is not a skirt. This is more likely a romper or a set of loose pants. This cartoon or, is seen by uh, Clara Bow. Now, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Clara Bow. She was basically the Scarlett Johansson of her day. If you had a movie in Hollywood that you wanted guaranteed to be success, you got Clara Bow as your actress. Having her name attached to a film product was guaranteed to sell tickets at the box office. Clara has her seamstress make this outfit. And she credits Ethel Hayes as her inspiration. So Ethel is defining and inspiring the fashion setters and the trend setters. But she goes beyond fashion and she really starts affect, or I'm sorry, um, this is actually a new slide for me and I'm really excited about it. So, when we think about women's fashion in the 1920s, and we think about women's fashion before the 1920s. Before the 1920s, we had longer skirts. We tended to have more fitted tops, uh, higher collar or higher collars here, thick stockings. So when we think about women's undergarments, we're thinking petticoats and slips. We're thinking long bloomers. We're thinking corsets or chemisettes. Now let's shift to the 1920s and think about what the clothes look like. They're much shorter. You can't wear bloomers and have them peeking out under your skirt. They're much looser at the top. So your corset is now worthless. I'm sure women needed an excuse to get rid of their corsets. Um, the dancing that a lot of flappers participated in, the shimmy, the Charleston, these are very energetic dances. Your chemisette is not gonna work. So it, requ it starts requiring a different type of undergarment. And now here we have Ethel illustrating women's underclothes in a daily newspaper across the country. And women, being pragmatic, mostly, sees, they see the comfort 
that these documents allow. And they see their practicality. They are cheaper to make, they are cheaper to maintain, they're cheaper to buy. So as more and more women across the country start identifying these alternative styles of undergarments, women's companies, clothing companies, start making them in higher quantities to meet the demand. So in a large way, we actually start seeing the introduction of brief style underwear. And brassieres, as we would recognize them today, are coming about in the 1920s in large part because there's finally a market for them big enough to justify their, their manufacture. And when we talk about why is there a large enough market, we can kind of indirectly point back to the fact that Ethel is advocating for it. Ethel is drawing it. Ethel is giving us a reason and opening um, rural women's and in small town America, she's opening their eyes to the things that are available to them across the country. Uh, as I mentioned, her influence goes beyond fashion and clothing. Uh, she starts affecting mentalities. This piece was, uh, it's from Michigan, Ironwood, Michigan, in 1927. It was written by one of the women's columnists, the local women's columnists that would, you know, answer questions from everything like, how do I keep my boiled eggshells from sticking to what's the next fashion, you know, what's the next hat that I should be wearing? She runs this piece, um, the first sentence, Ethel Hayes says the reason why so many marriages are failures is because so many failures are married. <laughs> nice, pithy, and to the point, and about as good as logic as I have ever heard. She goes on to say here, not so long ago, few, not so long ago, women would have dared to marry an idler, a drinker, or a waster to reform him. She was completely at his mercy. Now it is different. A girl takes her place in the economic world and chances that, and she takes chances that her mother or grandmother would never have dared to take. Her independence makes it less necessary to be sure of the man she marries. So now we see Ethel Hayes influencing young women and saying, you do not have to get married right away. You do not have to settle for a man because you can take responsibility and take agency in controlling your own economic future. In 1927, and this columnist bases her entire argument on an Ethel Hayes cartoon. Now, recognizing that Ethel's pretty cool, and she's pretty influential, and she's becoming more popular, but it's really important to remember and to note that she does not forget where she's from. And she continually travels west to visit her parents, to spend time with her family. They go on a lot of vacations. They hit Glacier Park. Uh, they go to Yellowstone, they go to um, what is today Custer State Park. And on one of those visits, she meets a, a young man named William Sims. Uh, as she identifies him, uh, for the first time in my life, I found a man who could ride a horse as well as I can. <laughs> it's apparently love at first sight. Uh, they marry the last week of December 1925, and uh, it, I think it's really interesting to note that even after her marriage, uh, she continues to sign all of her work with her maiden name. Uh, in fact, her husband William goes on record and, and admits that he would, quote, be some piker to take Ethel's cute flappers away. Uh, I do have this image here, if anybody's familiar with the 1937 flood in Billings. Uh, that corresponded with one of Ethel's visits back to her parents. She actually came in just a few days before the flood hit. Timing is perfect, apparently. Uh, the flood comes through and she takes the opportunity to draw some cartoons for the Billings Gazette. So these particular drawings were only run in the Billings Gazette and they are the only cartoons published under her married name. Now, when Ethel marries William, um, just like her friend Victoria before her, and just like is expected of her, she issues her resignation to the National Syndicate. And they basically say, not on your life. In fact, the note from the circulation department says, keep that girl at all costs. And what we find is that Ethel has become so incredibly indispensable for the newspaper's success. 
Uh, the advertisement that we have here is run from the Pittsburgh Press, and they basically say we are the only newspaper in Pittsburgh with Ethel cartoons. This reason alone is why you should continue subscribing to the Pittsburgh Press. Newspapers are using her to expand their women's readership. They're recognizing that women are now a huge market, and Ethel is a way that they can hook them in. And when we really look at her importance, we see that the newspaper, the National Syndicate, is giving her, they're really pushing uh, information about her. They want to make her relatable. They want you to feel like Ethel is your friend. So in this particular newspaper, she has given the top eight columns at the top of the page on the women's page. That's pretty important. This is, the, this is what you want to see. And Ethel's success uh, is really noticed not just by subscribers and not just by readers, I guess, but also by other syndicates. And the other newspaper syndicates in the country really try to um, take advantage and duplicate what she's doing. So here we have the next three largest syndicates in the country, and they all have some kind of flapper-themed cartoon. In my humble opinion, they don't even come close. There's just um, something missing. The lines aren't as clean. The sayings aren't quite as witty. Uh, the faces are not as emotive. They're not quite as relatable as Flapper Fanny and as Ethel. And you can see that in the syndicate's membership. Even though they're trying to take advantage of this trend of women identifying with the Flappers, they're just not able to quite capitalize on it. Ethel is one of a kind. Now, Ethel um, really becomes fantastic at operating within the stipulations the society puts on her, but becoming incredibly popular in spite of it. And as part of that is, is why the National Syndicate prints so much information about her, so much biographical information. Um, but they really play up the fact that she is a professional woman and a family woman. She maintains the home, children, keeps her husband happy, and she never misses a deadline. Uh, so they do things like they call her studio in the backyard a grown-up playhouse. Uh, one feminist writer of the time says she had a honeymoon, furnished a flat, later on moved and furnished a house, had a baby, built a decorated studio, and has never missed a day with her drawings. She goes on to say she's a real feather in the feminist cap. What they don't say is that Ethel had a full-time live-in housekeeper. <laughs> the Billings Gazette in 1929 says that Ethel Hayes Sims is now recognized as an outstanding example of a woman who enjoys her, her home and family and still has a career. Now, all of this shifts 1929-1930. And we look at the national context of the Great Depression coming in. And as with any major economic downturn, it greatly affects um, how people look at American culture. And one of the key attitudes that comes out is this belief that, well, if we just go back to the way things were, everything was okay before. We just go back to that, it takes, it will get rid of our current problems. But the danger in that kind of thinking is that we don't always remember the little details that made that part just as bad as this part. So for example, some of the attitudes that are coming out during the Great Depression, um, Norman Cousins uh, in the Midwest makes a statement. He goes, simply fire the women who shouldn't be working anyway and hire the men. Presto, no unemployment, no relief rolls, no depression. The uh, National Recovery Administration codes in the early 1930s set a lower minimum wage for women during the same job as men, and 26 states enact laws prohibiting the employment of married women. Uh, Earl Leiby in Ohio makes the statement. He says, you are probably aware of the fact that homes are being wrecked daily due to the fact that married women are permitted to work in factories and offices in this land of ours. The excuse is often brought, or I'm sorry, you and we all know that the place for a wife and mother is at home, her palace. The excuse is often brought up that the, the husband cannot find employment. It is the writer's belief that if women were expelled from places of business, these very men would find employment. 
And these same women's husbands would naturally be paid a higher salary inasmuch as male employees demand a higher salary than females. 1933. So the idea is that, you know what, if we just get rid of the women, we put them back where they're supposed to be in their homes and in their kitchen, the men will get the job, they'll get a higher pay, and they'll just take care of the women, and that'll solve our problem. So as we see, cartoons reflect the culture and reflect the readership, or they won't be accepted. And we see this shift in 1929 through about 1931. Cartoons are really moving away from those controversial, edgy, bold female characters that we had before. And they're reverting back to images of children and animals and romance. Uh, this comic is actually really interesting because it's by another female Montanan artist. Her name is Fanny Corey. Her work really becomes popular in the 1930s. My argument is in large part because of what she's depicting. Uh, she actually lived on her husband's ranch outside of Helena, if anybody's curious. So right about the same time frame, um, Ethel sees the writing on the wall, and she makes the announcement that, you know what, I've had a really great run, but my family is um, becoming too important to me and the cartooning is taking up too much of my time, and I'm gonna shift over. Uh, so, she hands the reins of Flapper Fanny to Gladys Parker. Now, it's really interesting, Gladys Parker is actually able to use her work with Flapper Fanny uh, to springboard into a career of fashion design. Little interesting note there. Uh, it's really amazing that Ethel identifies and highlights another woman cartoonist and is very intentional about handing uh, her work over to a young cartoonist to be able to build her career. And then Ethel stays in the business, but she doesn't do the dailies anymore. So things like she's picking up work uh, with the syndicate and illustrating the chapter's uh, serial stories. Uh, she works with Ellis Parker Butler, who uh, printed numerous serial stories throughout the 1930s. Uh, and we can really see Ethel's work continuing. And, and her, her style is really well established and recognizable at this point. So now we're seeing Ethel's illustrations use an equal role with the author to help sell these stories. Ethel also shifts her focus over to what's called Every Week Magazine. Now, uh, the syndicate would put together basically a small magazine for Sundays. They would send it out to all of their subscribers, and then it was just an insert that they could put into the Sunday paper. Ethel was given sole responsibility of illustrating the covers. So for about nine to 12 years, every single cover of Every Week was an Ethel Hayes design. We see that she starts playing with space to tell stories. So she's not ref um, confined to just a little two column inch space. She's able to use an entire page. She's able to, to expand her details. Uh, the, the knots here on this halter top, the cork shoes, the way that she uses the waves uh, to give the illusion of being underwater. Just this one's really great because we have what we would consider a, a very um, gender normed line of women in a beauty pageant, except they're not, they're actually getting in a fight and the winner is now covered in bandages. So she starts playing with space and color and illustration to really start telling stories. And we start to see her style adapting and changing a little bit. Uh, one of the things that she says is that uh, she loves having her daughters work in her studio with her. Yes, because she's a mother and she wants her children close to her at all times, but also because she was never quite sure how to draw a child, so having a little girl in front of her was a perfect model. Uh, this is more than likely modeled after her daughter Babs. Uh, in fact, Leslie shared a story with me that uh, she had a friend that Ethel would always use as the dark-haired model, just so that she could get the face shape and then everything right. But we see her style adapting from the, the sleek, styles we saw in the newspaper to the rounded cherubic images here. And this really serves her well. And in 1938, she partners with the Christian Science Monitor and illustrates a series of poems called Manly Manners. Uh, these are then collected and published in a book. 
Some of you may even recognize it. This opens doors for her in other illustrated capacities. Uh, she starts working with the McCormick Mathers uh, Publishing Company in Wichita, Kansas, and putting together school materials. So it's advertised as a seat work series, so things that school children can use at their desks in the classroom. And we have paper dolls, we have reading exercises, matching activities, uh, and just to illustrate the popularity of this work, the copyright on these pieces was um, renewed through into the early 1980s. And she started illustrating them in the 1930s. And then of course, um, it opens the door for her to start illustrating children's books. And when I talk about Ethel Hayes to people who've never heard of her, I always say, I guarantee you've seen her work. Guaranteed because she illustrated the very first Raggedy Ann and Andy. Because that original, or I shouldn't say original, but the 1940s, 1950s version of Night Before Christmas is hers. The early mother goose, town mouse, city mouse, or, or town mouse, country mouse. One of the original Peter Rabbits. These are all, this is all her work. Uh, one of the really amazing things about Ethel is that she takes her ability to tell stories and images, and this is the perfect marriage for her. But she's really kind of a pioneer at it. Because before Ethel starts illustrating children's books, children's the book illustrators would just do the action that the text said. So for example, she illustrated the 1938 Little Red Hen. And in the story, there's a portion where I think um, the little red hen bakes a loaf of bread and she's tricked out of it by another animal and they steal her loaf of bread. Every other version of this story just so shows the animal walking away and the little red head, hen like kneading dough. In the Ethel Hayes version, the little red hen is angry and frustrated. So first of all, Ethel can depict a chicken with emotions. <laughs> Secondly, she's using this to illustrate how the little red hen feels. Before Ethel, children's book illustrations was action only. Now she's incorporating emotion into these drawings to the point that you can almost make the argument that you don't need the, the author's text at all. You can just tell it with the story. Ethel Hayes officially retires in 1975 and she and her family moved to New Mexico and to Arizona. Uh, but she continues to draw and paint por uh, portraits. Uh, she focuses and has a series on Native Americans of the Southwest. She uh, paints a lot of family portraits well into her 90s. Uh, in fact, she, she made the statement in 1982, she goes, my arms just aren't long enough to paint anymore. That didn't stop her, she continued to paint. Uh, in March of 1989, um, Ethel passed at age 97. And it's important for us to remember that Ethel had an amazing influence across the country and is really uh, so vital to a lot of the changes that were happening with women's culture and, and what women were allowed to do in that time frame. But through it all, she identified and actually gave credit to being a Western girl. I absolutely love this 1914 quote. Um, I will always tell them Montana is my home. I never give interviews without first telling the reporter that he must refer to me as from Billings. In 1928, she told a, rep or a reporter described her as Ethel is a typical Western girl. Breezy, slangy, wisecracking, warm and mellow with human sympathy and understanding and as unspoiled as the mountains of the West, which she loves. Ethel returned to Billings um, in 1989 in that she's buried here. Ethel is actually buried at Mountain View Cemetery, so I'd encourage you to go lay a flower on her grave and thank her for being able to wear makeup and have short hair. The cartoon that I found here, I felt just really encapsulated who she is and what she did. Here at the top, we have a, a cowgirl who says, um, my, but this so-called flapper must be a terror. On the opposite side, we have a flapper that says, those Western girls surely are wild. But here they are meeting in the middle, and it says, as I live and breathe, you may look queer, but you seem like a regular girl to me. 
So with that, um, I will, I thank you very much for spending time with me, and I will leave you with a final image. Uh, looking at the season that we have today, Christmas is next week, ready or not, uh, Whenever we think of the night before Christmas or we think of Santa, one of the images that always comes to our head is Santa in his sleigh with a reindeer over the snow-covered rooftops of a village. That image was really first done by Ethel. So with that, I say Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and I will open the floor to any questions that you might have. Yes, ma'am. How much time did Ethel spend in Billings as an adult? She would make at least one, possibly two or three trips a year, as long as she had, whenever she had family here. So until her parents passed, um, which was mid 19, her mother was still alive until the 1930s. Um, she was always coming back to Billings at least once a year, and still maintained friendships here. Um, in fact, we have a letter from Hazel Hunkins, written later in life, I think it's to Helene O'Donnell, uh, and, and Hazel says, have you heard of my good, from my good friend Ethel? What is she doing? She continued a friendship with Cooley Moss and Melville Moss. Um, she would come back for, in fact, uh, I heard a story that she came back one time for a funeral, a family funeral, and was staying with Melville at the Moss Mansion, and would just invited people over to see the Moss Mansion. And if anybody's familiar with Moss history, that was not done. Um, you, you did not invite other people in to see the, the mansion. But Ethel had that gregarious nature and she just basically said, well, if I'm staying here, I'm going to have friends over uh, and they're going to get to see the moss too. Yes? Did either of your children have any of her artistic uh, I'm sure that she taught them pieces. Um, whether or not they pursued a career in art, I, not to my knowledge, not to my knowledge. Any other questions? Yes. Can you mention how you're using this work? Yes. So um, because we've fallen in love with Ethel and we think that her story needs to be shared with everybody, uh, don't get me, you know, I'll, I'll get on a soapbox anytime you want me to, but we are incorporating this research and this information into several exhibits that we have planned for next year. Uh, so when we reopen in March, 2020, one of our exhibits is called Saints and Sinners, and it highlights 10 women in Yellowstone history that pushed boundaries. Some of them pushed those boundaries from within, and some of them really pushed from that without, from the outside. So Ethel is one of those women. And then next fall, we are taking this information and we're developing or hoping to develop a traveling pop-up exhibit, much like the Hazel exhibit, so that her story can travel across the region uh, to schools and libraries and other museums who have an interest in telling Ethel's story. Yes? I have a great aunt who graduated the year after she did mm -hmm. in high school. And she went on to become a lawyer. And I'm, I'm wondering who influenced these women. Can I just say that that is a question we as a staff ask each other every month? Because there is a whole collection of amazing women who all went to school together um, several years apart, but still taking the agency and the responsibility of changing, changing the culture for all women across the country. We have Hazel Hunkins, we have Ethel Hayes, and numerous other women that step up and really fill roles that were not open to them, and they car literally, I, I say they chiseled a place for themselves. They didn't carve it, they chiseled it out. So that is that's a question that we, we ask ourselves every couple of weeks, and if, we have, if anybody comes up with an answer to that, please let us know. I like the senator uh, but it's probably just the spirit of the people that they grew up with that came to Montana, you know, the 1800s, they grew up in these families that were, had the balls to come to. I think there's some truth to that, I do, but we also have to acknowledge that Billings, um, we recognize it as a rough and tumble town in its early years, but because of the access to the railroad, it fully knew what it was supposed to do. And especially in the mid-19-teens, Billings kind of crosses a threshold. You know, in early, the early years, we have 
everybody supports each other and everybody pitches in because we have to for survival. And right about the 19 teens, mid 19 teens, we see Billings crossing a threshold where they're really starting to apply prejudice and community roles and gender expectations because they now have the the capability to do that. Because people aren't carving out their life, you know, people aren't depending on each other for survival anymore, we now have the luxury of applying these other things, which is really hitting right after they graduate. So there's there's always that acknowledgement within billing specifically, but, but within Montana too, of recognizing this is what I'm expected to do. I may not be able to work within those expectations, but I still recognize that that's the expectation that's put on me. Yes? Did you mention she had daughters? Did she have any sons? Uh, she had two stepsons. William actually had a previous marriage uh, and two sons by that marriage. She, uh, he was a widower and is actually buried with his first wife, which is why Ethel is here. She's buried with her parents here in Billings and not with her husband. So she had two daughters? Yes, she did. Uh, Dottie and Babs. Yes. I, I, don't want to, I, I may answer the question, but uh, Hazel Humpkins, Ethel Hayes, Wendell Hayes, the poet for Billings, all had a commonality, is that their mother encouraged education, all three of them. You know, like go out, do something beyond what I've done. All three of them clearly promoted education for their young daughters. So. And we're really hitting a time where women are actually gaining access to higher education. Um, in a way that was previously denied to them. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much.